Software and Security Engineering, Lecture 7, Segment 2. So we now have to start looking at software economics, and we have to look at this in the context of the overall software life cycle, and it can get very, very messy indeed. For example, consumers tend to buy on sticker price, and they prefer software whose sticker price is zero, even if they end up paying even more through advertising or other um, side deals, while businesses are much more focused on total cost of ownership. And yet you may end up having to deal with both business and um, consumer markets at the same time. Another feature of our industry is that vendors try to lock customers in for reasons that we will explore in much more detail in the economics, law and ethics uh, lectures next year. Um, but one of the obvious and pervasive aspects of this is that we get dominant firm market structures where a small number of firms tend to dominate in each segment and bargains are followed by rip-offs. But let's ignore all that from now and consider the simplest case where you've got a company that's developing and maintaining software entirely for its own use. So we might be talking, for example, about Lyons Coffee House, um, which bought the second ever um, EdSac computer after the lab developed the first one and is now in the process of hiring people to program it so that they can run their business. And what people rapidly discovered in the 1950s when they started using computers is that although they initially thought that the cost of software would be a, an upfront one-off cost, it turned out to be not that way at all. The initial development cost was perhaps 10% of the total because you spent you know, an order of magnitude as much again maintaining the software through the system's life. So at the beginning, you might be spending money fairly quickly you know, with um, half a dozen or a dozen programmers working on your new system, and then you might let most of them go as you um, cut over to operations, but you would have to keep one or two people on, whether on staff or on contract, to keep on doing the maintenance, to keep on tweaking the system to deal with more coffee houses or with more products or more complicated menus or different kinds of billing. And over time, um, things become ever more complicated still because uh, with complexity, becomes uh, the, the system becomes more difficult to maintain and you end up having to add more staff until eventually you get to the point where you've got to trade it in and get a new one. And although the initial development might only last for half a year or a year or so, uh, the operations phase might last for a decade. And so the costs of maintenance all add up and they come to dominate. So how do you go about measuring the cost of software? Well, in the um, early 1960s, uh, the early adopters such as IBM and AT&T started to um, uh, run the numbers. And they found that, first of all, the average productivity of programmers uh, was a function of what type of software you were trying to uh, produce. With complicated, difficult things like operating systems, um, you would be lucky to get one and a half thousand lines of code per person per year. For something like compilers, which are still tricky and require bright people who understand computer science, you might get 5,000 lines of code per person per year. And for simple stuff like apps, you would get double that. AT&T, which at the time had a monopoly on telephone service provision in the USA, uh, got less productivity because telecom software tends to be even more complicated than the kind of business software that IBM was producing for its customers in banking and retail. So there were a number of people started looking at why this might be the case. Uh, Morris Halstead was the first, and he uh, thought it might just be a matter of entropy, and he found that if you simply took source code and compressed it to get a reasonable um, estimate of what the Shannon entropy of the software was, that gave you a better measure than simple uh, lines of code. Uh, McCabe then dug into this and started looking at graph entropy of control structures, and other people made it more complicated still, and there's some people still use a, a process called function point analysis, um, which basically does static analysis of the software to see how complicated it is and tries to estimate costs from that. Uh, but most people in industry have since gone away from such complicated metrics. The first generation lessons that had been learned by the 1970s by the time I was an undergraduate, were roughly speaking as follows. That first, you've got huge variations in productivity between individuals. If you've got guys digging holes in the road, for example, then the biggest and strongest laborer might be able to uh, dig a trench two times or perhaps three times 
faster than the puniest guy working on the building site, but no more than that. However, with software, uh, variations are very much larger. The best programmer in, in, in your company uh, might be able to write code at 10 times the speed uh, of the least productive programmer, and um, the real stars can be better than that still. And that's one of the reasons that we've got the ring, the association of um, alumni of the computer lab. It means that in 10 or 15 years time when you're doing your startup, um, you've got a network that enables you to hire other uh, computer lab grads to work in your company. Um, it's one of the reasons why places like Google and Microsoft, they often take people on first as contractors and they just watch you for the first six months or a year and they see if you're one of the superstars or one of the laggards. And it's only if you're one of the really productive people that they actually take you on as a staff engineer. So variation between individuals is the first lesson. The second lesson is that the main systematic gains come from using an appropriate high-level language. My first serious job at Ferranti was about um, adapting an inertial navigation set whose software was written in machine code. And I can tell you that was a complete pain because you had to perpetually remember um, you know, which memory address and uh, indeed which register um, would hold which specific variable at which time. And that would be a function of whether the uh, machine was in normal mode or in interrupt mode. And so you spent about half your time on housekeeping. Now, there's two types of complexity in software. There's the accidental complexity, like remembering that register 14, for example, during an interrupt um, holds the current yaw rate. And there's the intrinsic complexity, which is the difficulty of the underlying mathematics of doing navigation. And what we do with high-level languages is that we take away much of the accidental complexity. And as soon as you get computers that are big enough, that have got enough memory and have got enough CPU cycles, that you can afford to uh, program them in high-level languages, then you're well shot at the low-level low stuff, believe me. So that was another thing that people learned. And as soon as we had Fortran and COBOL in the early 1960s, People thereafter only wrote in machine code if they had to, you know, if the performance was so critical or the uh, computer was so small that there was no realistic alternative. The next thing that we learned is that extra effort put into getting the specification right usually pays for itself by reducing the time spent coding and testing. Now let's look at this, specification versus coding and testing. And in 1975, Barry Bohm, who was one of the pioneers of the study of software engineering economics, went out and collected a whole lot of data on this. And he found, for example, that where people were working out and building systems for the Pentagon that did command, control, communications, and intelligence, um, that the specification was almost half of the work. The code was about a fifth of the total project value, and the test was the rest, about a third. With space systems, it was the other way around. Um, if you were writing software for NASA, you put a third of the effort into the specification, understanding the celestial mechanics and how the spacecraft would approach the Earth or the Moon or whatever. Again, 20% would go in coding. And the rest, almost half of it, would go into testing. Because with a space mission, you can one shot at it. And if there's a bug, then you lose the mission and you maybe lose the astronauts. So you really test that stuff to death. With scientific programming, you put almost half of the effort into the spec and the rest was divided between coding and testing because understanding the problem, understanding what numerical analysis techniques you would use to work out an airy function or a vessel function or whatever is most of the work and scientific software tends not to be that mission critical. Business is interesting because initially business software was very much like scientific software and the people who wrote the first word processors and the first spreadsheets had to put serious effort into figuring out what on earth they were trying to do. However, by the 1990s, this had changed. And famously, in the late 1990s, Bill Gates once asked um, whether he was running a software company or a testing company, because by then, Microsoft was putting more effort into doing testing than it was putting into writing actual code because by then they understood what Windows was supposed to do, and they understood what Office was supposed to do, but as they developed it, as they added more features, the features had a habit of interacting with stuff that they already had, and so they had to test new versions of Office absolutely to death and on a wide variety of PC platforms and with a wide variety of printers and other peripherals. Otherwise, when they shipped an upgrade, they would get complaints from millions of angry customers. So the takeaway message from this is that if you're a toolsmith, 
as I'm sure many of you will be at some time in your career, you shouldn't focus just on the code. And in fact, um, since about 25 or 30 years ago, more and more of the effort um, that's been put into tools by people who invent new programming languages and development environments and so on has gone into reducing the costs of testing. This is the case with uh, regression testing. It's certainly the case with software as a service, um, which will be the subject of our guest lecture from Richard Sharp. And the reason for that is, well, even if you had um, a new programming language that would enable you to put 10% um, less effort uh, into coding, that's only going to save you 2% of the cost of a space mission. But if you can save 10% of the effort of testing, that's going to save you almost 5%. Right? So it's worth your while putting the effort into specification and testing and tools to support that rather than in tools to make the coding itself easier. Going back now to the 1960s, um, the first really large um, software project that um, anyone undertook, at least as far as anybody knows, was IBM's project around about 1960 to make the first modern mainframe, the System 360. That's the product with which uh, Tom Watson Jr. gambled the whole company, and the gamble came off because he established IBM as the leader, got the network effects going, and IBM dominated the computer industry until Microsoft dethroned it um, in the mid to late 1990s. And this project involved hundreds of person years of effort building the world's first proper operating system. And after this effort, um, Fred Brooks basically took early retirement from IBM and became an academic. He became a professor at North Carolina, became a pioneer of computer graphics, and he even visit, visited the Rainbow um, Group in the computer lab regularly on sabbatical, so we got to know him. And in this book, The Mythical Man Month, of which there's a sharp essay version uh, linked from the website, he describes the experience that he had uh, managing this enormous project uh, with hundreds of people uh, building uh, a really critical product on which the whole company had gambled its future. And one of his conclusions is that adding manpower to a late project makes it later. So how does this work? Suppose you've got a project that's supposed to take three developers four months. And then for some reason, the design work takes an extra month. Okay, so the, uh, the critical user goes on holiday, so he can't tell you his requirements. Um, or perhaps uh, the customer changes their mind or whatever. So whatever, for whatever reason, you end up having two months to do what you thought was nine person months of work. But if you go and get new people onto the team, it's going to take you time to train them. And while you're training them, your people are also going to be busy doing the training. Okay, so that's another last month. And so that means you're going to have to add six developers and the problem is that the work that three developers would have done in three months can't be done by nine developers in one month because of the interaction costs, right? The developers spend time talking to each other, and that's more uh, than linear. Uh, so it's no more possible for three developers to do, um, for nine developers to do three by three work than it is possible for, you know, nine women to have a baby in one month rather than um, one woman bringing a baby to term in nine months. And hence Brooke's law, adding manpower to a late project makes it later. So how can we bring such insights together into something resembling a quantitative model? Well, um, in the 1980s, Barry Bohm set out to um, collect data from lots and lots and lots of projects that had happened in the 60s and 70s and to graph out the results and draw lines through the graphs and figure out what could be the juice from them. And there's a number of rules that he um, got together in a book that he published in 1981 and which is in the library once that's um, available to you again. The two that I'm going to highlight here are first, that the number of project months you expect a project to last is A times number of lines, thousand lines of code to the power B. And here A is a constant, um, which refers to the type of code, as we saw a couple of slides ago, whether it's an operating system or an app or a telephone switch or whatever. And B um, is an exponent which expresses diseconomy of scale. 
right? So um, depending on the environment and uh, depending on the type of software you're writing, um, you've got a power B which expresses the fact that the amount of effort goes up more than linearly in the size of the project. The second law um, is that the cost optimal time to first shipment, T, is 2.5 times the total number of person months um, to the power one third. So um, what he found empirically um, is that where people have more time, the cost rises slowly uh, because people who have more time take more time um, and with less time, it rises very sharply indeed. And it's almost unheard of for a project to be finished in less than three quarters T, where T is 2.5 times the cube root of the number of project months. And these are bounds rather than predictions because it's always possible to screw up. As we saw earlier, some projects fail despite huge resources. And here's an insight again from Fred Brooks. This is um, stolen from an illustration in his book. Um, he likened um, software projects that get out of control to being tar pits. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever visited Los Angeles. I'm sure that almost all of you will at some time or another in your careers because California is the center of gravity of, of our business. And if you go past the end of Hollywood Boulevard, you'll find the La Brea Tar Pits, uh, which are a tourist attraction in Los Angeles because they're an archaeological site where you can find the remains of saber-toothed tigers, giant sloths, and other creatures from 40,000 years ago before the Ice Age. You can see in the background there are some woolly mammoths. And how these ended up in the tar pits being preserved for posterity is that if you're an animal and you put your feet in this sticky tar which comes to the surface in Los Angeles, it's basically crude oil that bubbles to the surface and then evaporates, then what you find um, is that if you try and pull your leg out by you know, um, standing on your other three legs, you may manage to pull one leg out, but the other three get stuck. And they've got a beautiful exhibit there whereby they've got a big pot of crude oil and some pistons, and you can try and pull one piston up while you push the other one down. And this really brings home the explanation of how you end up with all these lovely old fossils there uh, being dug out. Now, when you get involved in a death march project, as I'm sure many of you will, I certainly have been, you can find yourself in a bad place where the individual software problems are all soluble, but there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And as you solve problems, you create more problems. And so the total number of problems, the total number of tickets isn't going down, it's going up. So hey, what can you do about that? Well, you're kind of stuck once you get there, but what can you do to see to it that you don't end up there?